Thanks very much. So I'm Sarah Scobie and I'm going to start off and I don't have a mic. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear um, what we've got to say. So um, I'll stand near Eilish. Um, so uh, we're from the Nuffield Trust, which is a health policy think tank. Um, and over the years, we've done quite a lot of work on end of life care. Um, and uh, here's, here's some of that work. Um, what we wanted to do today is to run through a few different things. We're going to talk to you about a piece of work we've done on uh, the care of people who died at home. So um, I realise I've just skipped over that slide, but never mind. Um, the oh, there we go. So why did we do it? How did we do it? Um, what did we find? What we're planning to do next? Um, and then we also are going to reflect a little bit on what we learned in terms of the data that we used, uh, which was new to us at the start of the project. So as I said, we've done various pieces of work on um, end of life care over the years, uh, but what really uh, led us to restart this work was the shift in place of death that occurred at the beginning of the pandemic. So um, the numbers of deaths that occur in people's own homes has been increasing steadily over the years as a result of demographic change, the age at which people die, and policies to support um, people being able to choose to die at home. But there was this massive jump that occurred at the beginning of the pandemic, not just in the numbers, but also in the proportion of deaths. And um, we were really interested in this and what it meant for patients, for their families, for the services in the community that um, suddenly had this huge increase in, in, in demand for services. Um, and so uh, we aimed to address these questions. Um, so we aim to find out what services people used at home during the first year of COVID compared with the pre-COVID year. What were the demographic and social factors associated with the services that people used? Um, and also to see if we could investigate indicators of quality of care. So uh, great in some ways, more people dying at home, but actually what do we know about the quality of care that they were able to access, especially when there was so much service change going on? No, it's my turn. Oh, and I can't hear the mic, so I keep that's good. Yeah, so to do all of this, um, we use the Open Safely TPP platform. So Ben mentioned briefly in this morning's talk, um, trust research environments. So this is kind of one of the ones that they've been running. And um, the TPP platform covers primary care records um, for people registered at practices that use System 1 TPP. And it, they had the kind of platform involves data that kind of links hospital data and death registrations. So it covers 42.6% of the English population and it's representative, although um, it is very much influenced by where the TPP practices are. So there's not so many of them in London where EMS is used more frequently. Um, so we used a whole kind of set of standard functions and code lists to analyze the data. But because it was a relatively new system when we did this a year and a half ago, I think when we started, um, there were quite a lot of uncertainties about some things. So a couple of the ones that I put up there as examples. Um, so the, we have a kind of a measure in there of general practice interactions. And um, it's not just appointments, it can kind of be any um, instance where patients have had like a change to their record. So if they've got like a blood test result back or something like that, and there was a bit of an uns uncertainty at the time as to whether we were just capturing appointments or all of these other things as well, which I don't think we ever fully got to the bottom of, which is why we went with this broad term of interactions. Um, and then the other one that I've just put up there as an example is the community nursing team care, um, which is a code list that we developed and hasn't been validated in any kind of formal way. So there is some kind of uncertainty about those findings. And I'm going to talk a bit more later on about some of the learning um, from using Open Safely. So what we did was we identified people who died either pre-pandemic or during the pandemic. So we have two um, nine-month periods, so from June 2019 until February 2021, and then from June 2020 until Feb oh, sorry, February 2020 
February 2020, June 2020 to February 2021, there we go. Um, and then we looked at service use prior to death. So we um, kind of looked one month back in the main, but we also looked three months back for some things and then also a year back for the pre-pandemic period. And the reason why there's these kind of grayed out blocks on the on the chart is that we kind of wanted to um, know that our people that died during the pandemic had had kind of like a pandemic experience of care rather than this kind of model picture of pre-pandemic and pandemic care. So we compared their service use in those periods, and then we also looked at it by characteristics. And then one of the things we did kind of further along in the project was shared our findings with some patient and public involvement representatives, kind of get their reflections on um, what we were telling them in relation to their own experiences. So you'll see a few of these little green people along the way. So the first thing that we did was kind of look at variation in service use in the pre-pandemic period. So this is for the people that died in that kind of nine month period before the start of the pandemic. And um, down the kind of left hand side, you can see all the different services that we looked at. So there's a kind of a block at the top, the kind of community and primary care based. And then there's a whole chunk at the bottom, which are from hospital data. So the kind of main things to take from this are that um, people who died at home or in care homes kind of had more contacts with um, general practice services um, and then people who died in hospices and hospitals had more hospital contact and there's kind of a big cycle between um, you know the cause of death so people in hospices often die of cancer and then they kind of have more contact with hospitals and have more kind of elective admissions and outpatient appointments for those conditions so that kind of left us with some hypotheses about what we might see in our pandemic period so because there was a lot more people dying at home, we we're kind of expecting to see that there'd be an increase in use of community and primary care. And then because of the kind of shift in the types of people that were dying at home, so there's more people dying at home that might have had cancer and dementia, that that would then maybe change some of the other um, services used along the way as well. So the kind of overall messages for the change into the pandemic period are that Kind of people who died at home had kind of similar or more activity per person and um, they didn't stay away from kind of services at the end of life and with more people dying at home this had the biggest impact on services in the community and um, so i'm just going to go into all of that in a lot more detail now so the kind of first ones around the kind of care in the community increasing so um the chart kind of shows the events per person in the last month of life for the two periods so you can see that there was a big increase in general practice interactions for people who died in the pandemic and a slightly smaller increase for medications prescribed and then the palliative care and community nursing team care are kind of similar events per person but obviously because there was a lot more people dying at home that translates to a lot more activity for those services um, and so then our PPI representatives kind of reflected that even though we're seeing this big increase in quantity in the data, that doesn't necessarily reflect kind of an increase in quality of care that people were receiving. Um, and the kind of switch to remote care will have had a big impact on the kind of services and what people were experiencing. And then there was a big discussion in the kind of the workshops that we ran around some of the challenges around access to medications and understanding of their purposes. So even though, you know, we see this increase in medications prescribed, that's not necessarily that people then receive those medications. It might be kind of anticipatory ones that were prescribed but never actually delivered. And it doesn't capture that whole complication around getting the medications to the people. And um, so alongside the increase in community care, there was also a big increase in emergency care. So more people who died at home had a &E visits and emergency admissions in the pandemic. So got some icons, but the, um, so the proportion of people with one or more a &E visits increased from 16 to 17.3% in the pandemic. And so for people who died from dementia and Alzheimer's disease, they had kind of, of the different groups that we looked at, they had the kind of largest increase in a &E visits. And our PPI representatives kind of reflected on the massive loss of kind of informal care and support in the community during this period and how that may have led to kind of more urgent um, needs that had to be met in other ways than perhaps prior to this. Um, so yeah, so people had less planned care, 
So fewer people who died at home in the pandemic had elective admissions previously, and that kind of makes sense with the kind of big shutdown in elective services that were delivered in the period. Um, I want to move that, I guess. <laughs> but um, alongside that kind of... Oops. <laughs> alongside the kind of decline in elective admissions there was also an overall increase in outpatient appointments for people who died at home and so this kind of may partly reflect the kind of big shift in the fact that a lot more people who were dying from cancer were dying at home previously and you can kind of see the number of um outpatient appointments for people who died from cancer along the bottom there and that increases quite a bit in the pandemic period and um, so we did a bit of work looking at kind of across lots of different characteristics. So um, I'll just talk to you about a couple of them now. So the first one was that we kind of looked at the services used by deprivation. So in the pre-pandemic period and in the pandemic period, actually, um, people from the most deprived areas use less of almost all the services that we looked at. So there's lots of minuses on the chart, which kind of show the um, people from the least deprived areas having more than the, the most deprived. Um, and the only one there that we've shown is a &E visits where people from the most deprived areas had more. Um, and then the other thing to kind of note from this is that the gap between the most and, lead, most and least deprived group for general practice interactions and outpatient appointments into the pandemic. So for general practice interactions, um, it kind of increased from there being half a interaction difference to 0.85's difference. And um, our PPI group had kind of a really nice, we had some really good conversations about this, but I like this kind of quote about the fact that dying well requires people to be articulate, have time, energy, and persistence, and a self-belief that they deserve care when we were kind of talking about what difficulties people might face in terms of getting access to services. So we also had a bit of a look at ethnic group differences, and this was slightly challenged by the fact that recording of ethnicity improved during the pandemic. So we had a lot less unknowns and things in our data in the pandemic period, but um, we did look at some things. And um, the one, the chart here is the medications prescribed for symptom management. So you can see that in the pandemic or in the pre-pandemic period, um, people from mixed ethnic backgrounds had the most medications prescribed for symptom management. But going into the pandemic period, um, people from white ethnic backgrounds had a big increase and kind of ended up being the group with the most medications prescribed for symptom management. And there was declines in the um, Asian people from Asian ethnic background. As I said, it is slightly modeled by the unknowns. Um, yeah, so the final thing that we kind of did was look at um, some indicators of quality. Um, and I've just focused here on kind of the proportion of people with palliative care needs recorded in their records and so some kind of identification of people being at the end of life. So you can see in kind of the top numbers that the proportion of people with no kind of record of palliative care needs in their, this is the last three months of life, was 64% in the pre-pandemic period. And it went down slightly in the pandemic, but not by much. Um, but there was quite a bit of variation between the different causes of death. So um, cancer patients are much more likely to have palliative care needs recorded in primary care data, whereas people who die from circulatory diseases are much less likely, although there was a slight increase during the pandemic. Um, so that was quite a lot. So there's a little bit of a summary. So palliative care needs are often not recognised and recorded in primary care data for people who are dying. Um, and there's kind of this really large um, use of services at the end of life, but we don't really know a lot about whether it's kind of meeting people's needs from the data that we looked at. And certainly the kind of conversations that we had with the patient and public involvement representatives would imply that it might not be all the time. Um, kind of in terms of the impact of the pandemic, so uh, there's a lot more deaths at home, increased pressure on services in the community and primary care, um, inequalities kind of in some areas widened, um, there was kind of this shift from planned to emergency care um, and then kind of the changes varied between the causes of death and some of the other groups that we looked at. Um, so after we kind of did all that, we've done various kind of webinars and presentations to policy and ICF leads 
who are interested in end of life care. Um, we communicated our findings to um, kind of patient representatives and groups through kind of some partnership work with Hospice UK and Marie Curie. So we had some nice Twitter graphic things and um, my colleague Miranda uh, did a kind of a output targeted at patients and public people rather than kind of a research report, which is what I delivered on. Um, so in terms of what we're kind of thinking of doing next, we are going to look at kind of tracking service use over kind of a longer period of time. We were obviously limited with the data that we had um, at the time and the kind of the number of people dying at home has remained really high um, up until now. Um, so we want to kind of bring that time series up to date if we can, particularly as the kind of reasons for people staying at home are probably a bit different to what they were in that initial period that we looked at. Um, we also want to explore some more measures of quality of end of life care that are kind of more meaningful to patients. So we're planning some workshops and probably one of the things that we may end up looking at is kind of how um, advanced care planning and other kind of forms of care planning are recorded in the GP data. And um, we're going to build on our kind of findings around inequalities to kind of explore intersectionality because we only looked at each of our different characteristics in kind of on its own. We didn't do any kind of modeling to see what would happen if we adjusted for the other characteristics. So um, to get my notes, this one so I can remember all my icons. And so this is just a bit of a summary of what it might be interesting to do with kind of our experiences of using Open Safety, which is a fairly new kind of way of analyzing data. Um, so kind of going clockwise in the challenges, um, it's, I think our IT manager probably deserves the biggest acknowledgement for delivering this report because he spent so much time with me getting all of the different bits of software that you need for that platform to work. Um, so there was a lot of computer says no. Um, the black box is kind of, even it's, I suppose I should give some background to open safety. So you, you analyze, you don't ever see the real data, you're analyzing dummy data that you then, you then send your code to the real data afterwards. And that means that you can't do any of that nice thing that you'll do as an analyst often of testing something out and kind of checking that it's worked and then going back in this iterative post process. Um, it takes a lot uh, longer to do that whole section. So you'll have to, you have to think about 50 steps ahead. So um, a lot of it kind of felt a bit, black box, even though there's piles of kind of documentation out there, and we did get there in the end in terms of the analysis, um, it was a very steep learning curve to begin with, and a very different approach to doing analysis. So then um, the, the little world thing, and um, that's just about kind of coverage. So we kind of had to bear in mind the whole way through this, that we were only using this TPP half of the open safety platform. So we didn't have the EMIS data and um, the coverage while it is representative in terms of characteristics didn't cover um, some areas as well as others. And then my question mark was just around the kind of uncertainty that I kind of brought up at the start about some of the measures that we were using. Um, we decided to kind of go ahead and use the data because it was new and a good opportunity, but we did have some concerns about data quality, etc. cetera. Um, and then in terms of the benefits, um, so the magnifying glass, um, it, was a, it was a new data set. Um, primary care data is really important for people who are dying at home. Like it's a, definitely an area that we needed to cover. And this was kind of a relatively easy way of us getting access to it um, compared to some other data access processes that we have gone through in the past. And it's also, even though it's not the whole population, it was a really large chunk of it. Um, my spanner and screwdriver. Uh, so we kind of really enjoyed some of the, the tools that kind of sat alongside Open Safety. So the ability to kind of create the code lists of um, for the primary care data that were relevant to our project. So we had some help doing um, various different medications code lists, which is not our area of expertise, but the whole system around setting that up was really great. Um, the light bulb uh, ideas. So we had a co-pilot from Open Safety at the start who helped us kind of um, get set up. But then there was loads of other kind of opportunities along the way to to learn from other people. So 
I really enjoy they have a Slack channel for it where everyone's kind of posting in their questions of things that they're kind of struggling to do. And I learned a lot from that about how to approach our analysis and kind of the ability, I suppose I'm advocating for open, open source here, um, having all of the code up on GitHub and being able to kind of look and, because it's a standard set of functions, being able to look and see what other people had done with those functions sped up some things for me quite a bit. Um, and then finally, they have the kind of show and tell sessions every few months, so you can kind of see what other people are doing with the data. And so then that all kind of accumulates in my brain cogs thing. Um, <laughs> it's the kind of just the learning. So it was, you know, a massive learning opportunity for me that I'm kind of now spreading amongst our team. Um, and it was just a good experience. So uh, that's just kind of the acknowledgements of other people in our team and then all the kind of people in our advisory group that we had for the project. And thank you to our traditional public involvement group as well. You didn't even have to get any of my cards up. Um, so thank you very much for a fascinating um, presentation there. Any questions? Please. Um, I think it was slide eight because I took a photo. You said that the people that had the most uh, access to secondary care services were, the, uh, were those that had died in hospital or died in a hospital. And then I didn't hear you clearly. Did you say that's because you know that they had cancer and they were having a lot of hospital treatments because of the cancer or that a hypothesis that you had? I mean, so we did look at some of the kind of interplay between the causes of death and the different characteristics. That was a bit of a hypothesis around people who die in hospices are often dying of cancer. And so there's that kind of loop. Yeah. Anybody else? Peter. Um, I just wondered if um, you were been able to see that like, during the pandemic, there's been a reduction in the kind of activities that goes on in the hospital and the dying. It's presumably it's, it's decided. I mean, we looked at emergency admissions in the last month and three months of life, I think, didn't we? which yeah. went. It's a bit down, of a confused up. picture. It's, I, down, I think one of the, so we didn't specifically look at late stage chemo. Um, one of the challenges that I think we had between the two time periods is that uh, the services change, but also the cohort of people dying at home changed. So with it was by and large more people who might have died somewhere else were dying at home. So unpicking what might be going on there was quite tricky. Just the social dynamics change, social dynamics are part of what these things happen. Yeah. It's not Please. Partly responding to Peter's point is that you know prior to the pandemic, we've been certainly with my trust, it was seen dying in hospital, okay, dying out of bad, uh, and that's even reflected in shim for down to or uh, having out of high altitude, it'd be really interesting to see what happens now or in a period of post-pandemic or in excess deaths. So, yeah, so you'll have know, had pre-pandemic <laughs> below, uh, below expected or at expected mortality interfering period of the pandemic, and then post-pandemic period of excess deaths, where we had a seismic shift of patients dying. Out of hospital, but within 30 days of discharge. We noticed that shift. <coughs> Sorry, who's the lead? So it might just switch you. I'm not giving the empty away at all. No, no, no. Or a little more nasty. But nationally, it's happened as well. So it went from sort of 37% of deaths being, or sorry, 33, 32% of deaths being outside of hospital, but with a bit of discharge to sort of 37 to 38%. And it's not subsequently correct. 
Thank you. Anybody else got any questions? My comment was very uh, no, sorry, was to say if you've had problems with your IT managers oh, getting the right sure. software on, I just wonder what it'd be like to still keep one in the hospital. Would you like to lose open safely uh, data? Um, and I also wondered, uh, did you look at children's or oh, the impact? Was the numbers too small? The numbers were really low for the children. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, we're obsessed with paediatric services. <laughs> <laughs> so I can always ask a question. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. I think it's just um, I was just gonna say um it's always helpful when people are willing to be at the vanguard in relation to the open safety system and the kind of so A thanks for that and B, I think you can see in some of the narratives how you can improve it more that DPI is involved and that it helps with the hypothesizing and the work. So yeah, just uh, yeah, you're the yeah. Anybody else? Anybody questions before we all come together and say thank you and do a bit of a transfer to the next speaker. Well done, well done. <laughs> 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 <laughs>